opportunity to welcome you all on our portfolio committee meeting on agriculture land reform and rural development and also uh, take this opportunity to welcome all the officials of the department who are with us on this portfolio committee meeting. Uh, we have uh, three agendas on our uh, program and I will defect to two uh, where we will be getting a briefing from the Department of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development on the Plant Health Phytosanitary Bill, as well as the Deeds Registries Amendment Bill. Uh, we have also received honorable members on uh, Wednesday a, a request uh, from the department that we should nominate uh, candidates who will serve onto the ARC uh, and the closing date I should highlight is today end of business day so I would uh, suggest the, the honorable members send in their nominations directly uh, to uh, the department uh, before four o'clock this afternoon. If uh, you have any recommendations and nominations you'd like to make, please ensure those names get to the secretariat so that we can send the names through to the department. Allow me to therefore, honorable members, take this opportunity to welcome to the platform the officials of the Department of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development to take us through on the first presentation, which will be on plant health phytosanitary bill. If you can enlarge the slide so we can see it fully on slide mode. Recording in progress. Honorable Chairperson, um, good morning, and I hope I am audible. And good morning to yes. members of the portfolio committee. I've been battling, but on my side, it looks like it's full screen. Um, I'll try and get assistance, but for now... Good morning. Good morning, Honorable Chairperson. We are seeing two slides on uh, the mm -hmm. screen. Um, if you can just enlarge uh, it into slide mode so okay. that we only see one slide per time. Okay. 
because it is showing the slide and then on the side it is also showing the next slide that you gonna so it makes it difficult to follow the presentation when we don't see it in full size If I may ask the secretary to also load, because maybe it's my gadget, uh, on will chair with your indulgence, uh, they can load, I'll, I'll stop sharing, so it can be shared on their side. All right, uh, can uh, Ralph and the secretariat assist in flighting the presentation so that we can be able to see it in full? Thank you. Now we can see it. You may proceed in that. Thank, thank you, Honorable uh, 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 Chairperson, and thank you very much for, for allowing us the opportunity. The, this is the plant health uh, uh, bill, or we even call it phytosanitary uh, bill. I will explain with your indulgence because the network is not that good. I ask that I get a switch off my camera. The bill, phytosanitary bill, the purpose uh, really is to, to take the uh, uh, portfolio committee through uh, what we intend to do as the department. And uh, as a start, the question is why this bill? Um, our members are already aware that um, uh, plant health, unlike animal health, plant health is not a concurrent mandate. Uh, so, so, so it's the preserve of the national department, and uh, what we do, therefore, at the national level, uh, has got to be, it's got to ensure that it covers and uh, that uh, everything that happens as far as the uh, plant or arable farming is concerned. The key reasons why the amendment is that the current law that we have as a department which regulates the plant health predates 1994. So it is an agricultural pest act of 1983. And uh, it predates the constitution of the country. Yeah, and, and at the time when it was- uh, oh, uh, um... uh, Excuse me, Chair, I think somewhere I'm getting the feedback. So at the time when the uh, uh, Agricultural Pest Act was promulgated, the focus was not really on trade. And uh, as all members know better than me, that the status of the country at the time. So the focus was really on not on trade, well, but was on the control of pests within the Republic. Yes, it continued now we, South Africa trades with its uh, 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 counterparts and other countries. And for that to happen, uh, there has to be a, 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 a relationship uh, as far as our law is concerned and the laws of other countries. The WTO World Trade Organization has got a, a, a bodies, a statutory bodies. One of such that could be familiar to honorable members for animal health is called, used to be called OIE, which is in French to refer to World Organization on Animal Health. The, the plant health version of OIE is called the uh, International Plant Protection Convention. So this body of the World Trade Organization ensures that the, the work around the world, all members, all the countries that are signatory to WTO are able to negotiate and discuss issues of plant health uh, in, a, in a more centralized, for, centralized forum and are able, therefore, to, to have scientific discussions, which, which, relate, which will relate, therefore, to, as you see, the uh, phytosanitary matters. Maybe before I uh, confuse them, all of the members, we interchangeably, as members would have seen, interchangeably use the word plant health or phytosanitary. The difference really are not much. Uh, phytosanitary, as you think of SPS, 
sanitary and phytosanitary. So, so the, the P and the SPS is for phytosanitary and phytosanitary, phyto meaning plants. So sanitary meaning just the hygiene and ensure that free of diseases and free of, of insects. So that is the sanitary part. So phyto is animal, a plant and plant product free of diseases and free of uh, uh, insects, that's pests. So, so that's basically, so, so at the end, towards the end, when the, the law goes and the committee considers the bill going forward, we will make the determination on with regard to whether this becomes plant health bill or phytosanitary a bill and later because, but the really we are interchangeably using the words for now. The difference really are not, uh, the, 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 there aren't any significant difference. We we defining this specific uh, 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 acronyms or this concept for with the purpose of ensuring that as we will be taking through the panel, I mean the, the members through the presentation, you, we will see this uh, 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 concept uh, appearing or reappearing. Quarantine pest. This is an insect that, or it can even be a disease that is not known to occur to a country. So if we say a pest is, is a quarantine pest to South Africa, we are saying this pest does not occur in South Africa or is not known to occur. Two things happen when a pest is not known to occur, it would not have what you call natural enemies. So it means it would, because it would be new, it will not be, uh, if you look at the, the food chain, uh, so it, it, it will not have other organisms that pass on it or that feed it. So its numbers might therefore in, uh, uh, might, might increase and make and as, as they increase, we may not be able to control them because secondly, we would not have a chemical control for it. So, so a pest, then if you, if you see the way throughout the presentation quarantine, it means uh, it would be, if it's a pest or a disease, it means it's that which does not occur and we do not have any means of control. We wouldn't have because it does not occur. And it is called quarantine because it, uh, it may not have a, a, a natural enemy. So any uh, organism, as you members know, has its natural enemy that is a feed on it or prey upon it. That way it, it helps to control it and then the numbers becomes manageable. But it's perhaps we're going to regulate a pest means that they, there are those that may, they may not necessarily be quarantined pests, but they may, they, they, all of them in the main are regulated. But when you say a pest is regulated, it means that there's a focus, specific focus on, on uh, uh, or from the government because we do not want it to occur and would even, this is part of the intention of this act, we want to empower the department minister to be able to demarcate areas and also that uh, uh, certain uh, 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 crops may not be uh, 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 farmed with and uh, demarcate or also make measures regarding the control of pests. So regulated means it's within the focus of government and as, as and when it occurs, government comes in. One of the members would remember the, 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 the situation we had with uh, 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 false, uh, uh, we have already now with the false quickly moth in the in the in Europe, they are saying a, a false quickly moth is a quarantine pest to them, so they are saying they do not have. So so reg so so regulated pest means it's a pest that may not necessarily uh, 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 it 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 may, have, it may have natural enemies, but it is it might be a pest of agricultural economic importance. So government has got to come in and control it. You uh, members would know of the locust control at the moment. Second slide. So problem statement basically is simply that we want to be able to um, uh, update this act, which is uh, was enacted in 1983. And it's got a lot of things that, uh, or a lot of uh, its reach or its coverage does not cover a lot of things that are now 2023 have to be having to be covered as far as agricultural trades in or trade in agricultural products of plants or origin or in plants themselves. 
So, so at the moment, this Agricultural Pest Act, it does not cover the areas that it does not recognize, for instance, the, uh, the International Plant Protection Convention, because this was uh, 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 in 1997, and uh, there are standards that uh, have got to be adhered to by all countries. This would call IPPC standards, which is IPPC, obviously, that the abbreviation for International Plant Protection Convention. And again, the IPPC of the World Trade Organization expects of all countries uh, signatory, uh, that are signatory to the World Trade Organization to have their local version of the IPPC. So their local version becomes, in our case, it becomes National Plant Protection Organization. This is what we call competent authority. So, so when discussions about trade and uh, trade uh, negotiations happen, you we will then have a discussion happening between competent authority of South Africa and competent authority of the other country. So it will be the local version of the IPPC, which will be called the uh, National Plant Protection Organization. This in the main is formed by government officials from different spheres or different fields that are connected in, in as far as, in as, far as uh, edible, uh, plant health is concerned. So it will be uh, officials from uh, agronomists, it will be officials from plant pathologies, it will be officials from inspection services, it will be officials from the, the, the chemical or, or pesticide. So this, this forms this uh, uh, NPPO of, of South Africa. At the moment, we, we've got NPPO of South Africa, but it is not referred to or is not enabled by any provision of the Agricultural uh, Pest Act. So that's one of the reasons why we need, we, we want to have this act repealed and replaced with Plant Health Act. Uh, the current act, lastly, does not make provision for export control. So like I said, it was mainly designed in 1983 for control of pests, pests in diseases, insect, or even any other uh, organisms that would feed on crops and plant and plant uh, material and disrupt uh, uh, agricultural production. It, it had no, because of that, because it was not uh, linked to, to WTO, it only has, its, its focus was only based on uh, uh, South African uh, control and for pests within the state of South Africa. So, so the, this act therefore uh, is, is no longer relevant to the current dispensation. Next slide. Basically, this is what happened. And this is one of those uh, casualty uh, uh, bills because it has traversed the whole uh, route. And, uh, and at some point, uh, uh, having been to different uh, uh, committees, portfolio committee, it went through all the way until at the time when we thought uh, we were ready to have it assented into law, and then there was the, the political cycle changing. So we are where we are now. So we are going this route uh, that we have traversed before, and that means we've had to try and to get, we've had to get a new uh, 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 socioeconomic impact and assessment report again, because uh, we had to, we also went to, the office of the chief state law advisor again, because uh, uh, of course for of the, the the unfortunate situation that happened with regard to the political cycle. Next slide. So, what this seeks to do is, in this is the Agricultural Pest Act of 1983. Basically, it's about like I said pest control and it, through regulations, we've been trying to get it to, to align to the current dispensation and we've been able to have things uploaded from 1994 to date, but things get uh, more difficult uh, as and when uh, uh, things change. So at the moment, you remember to know that importation of uh, uh, goods uh, has got to be through a permit. Members already know that uh, those who, have, who fly internationally and especially those who go 
to Germany and uh, some part of Europe would see at the airport there are dogs, uh, the canine unit which belongs to this department, checking for fruits and plants and and and, and, and uh, plant products in the in the luggage of, of officials. If you take that scenario that I've just mentioned of the airport with that of other countries, you realize in South Africa all we can do is to confiscate the, the apple or the fruit and throw it away. We don't have any a follow-up legal follow-up mechanism. Uh, so, so even the the, the fee that uh, this act speaks of is about three hundred thousand or something. So it's not it does not uh, for lack of a better word does it's not at, at, the, at the standard of other uh, laws around the country. Where, as you members would know, if you are found to have controlled uh, 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 products without uh, permit. Uh, the people can even be jailed, and there's a lot of hefty fines. So at the moment, we do not have the the, the prov legal provision to impose uh, fines uh, uh, that are uh, that would be deterrent. Next slide. Basically, this is what uh, uh, this is going to be quick. This is uh, the section that when with the repeal. So so when we repeal the this this act. Some of the provisions would remain the same, but because the work that this bill brings into the, the uh, 1983 Act, it's more than 50% of the entire Act. Uh, we've just had to repeal the whole Act. But some provisions, those that are still applicable, will retain. But as members know, the, the magnitude of the new uh, provisions are more than 50% of the old uh, uh, provisions, hence the application to have the, the Act 93 repealed in its entirety. First gap there, by the central regulatory system of South Africa, which we do not have, so, so it would then be uh, brought in. And uh, this, once that's done, would then be able to speak from, uh, uh, enabled to speak, enabled by a provision of, of law of our Act to speak to areas of, of uh, uh, regulatory control. Uh, this is about ex import, this is about export as well. So at the moment, like I said, this act only speaks mainly uh, to import, not export. Next slide. So, so this is, like I said, I already spe specified this, that to provide measures to prevent the introduction, like I said, an establishment or spread of pests, regulated or quarantine pests. Quarantine pests, uh, one of the members, we, we should not have. So, so when you see all these countries having uh, border security or quarantine services, they have got only one intention, and that is to, to make sure that a pest that or a disease that we do not have in their country, in our country, does not get introduced. And the most uh, vectors or the most uh, 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 medium of introduction of pests and diseases is human beings. So, so as we travel, because uh, the world, we travel the world unintentionally uh, uh, traveling and also as and when we, we, we uh, open the country for, 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 for visitors from other countries, tourism. Tourism is found to be one of the most uh, 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 challenging areas for our, our sector because it is through tourism that pests and diseases are introduced. So, so this is one of the, the, the main reasons why we would, would want to ensure that we safeguard the, the country against introduction of regulated pests or, or quarantine pests. Regulated, even regulated, because we would have them and we'd have them under control and we'd have them not occurring at certain areas in our country. But if through travel that gets introduced, it then changes how we do things and it may affect uh, agricultural production and negatively affect obviously the economy and the food security. So in turn, once if once the, 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 the bill is in place, we'll then be able to ensure that uh, we've got sufficient regulation uh, uh, you know, and laws as far as traveling is concerned. And the current uh, export markets will then be able to service them uh, easily and when we meet for opening new markets, when we meet with our uh, counterparts, what you call competent authorities of other countries, we meet there 
NPPOZA. And we do not have a legitimate NPPOZA because our law does not make provision for it. But we've had to make do with what we, we have to be able to marshal ourselves into a structure which is equivalent to an NPPO of South Africa, NPPOZA, because we needed to have that in order for us to enable trade. Next slide. So the new bill in the main would provide, as I've as said, for the sanitary measures to prevent the introduction, establishment, and spread of regulated pests. Members would see here that I'm not referring to quarantine because quarantine is not supposed to even be there. Regulated pests will then have to control uh, in the country. This bill gives rise automatically to to X36, as far as it will then connect to X36 in the form of uh, 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 re registering for products, uh, agricultural remedies in the form of pesticides in this specific case. So what am I saying? If somebody or a company wants to register a chemical pesticide, first we've got to check if what that pesticide intends to control. So, so that process then, that's where the linkage, you can see the, the, the register of 836 of 1947 would then link up with the register of Plant Health uh, Act to see if indeed uh, there isn't one, there isn't any products uh, already, and to uh, assist towards the registration in the event of there be no uh, a product to, to control specific pests. The definitions, this will be in, um, in so, so basically we'll just finish this already. We are in the spirit of the, the, the of, of ensuring that uh, we ensure or, or we, 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 we have designed our law in such a way that it already conforms as in law, talking to subordinate laws of the, the, uh, of the, the Agricultural uh, Pest Act. So if those are the regulations that are to, we just make sure that we, we, we make do with what we have and with this new bill, we'll then be able to have these uh, definitions uh, 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 clearly provided for by the, the, the act and therefore enforceable. Uh, just a typical example here with the ISPMs, these are international standards for forestry measures. Members would see that at some point you will be, tra you'll be transporting even cement, but say, which is far, far away from agriculture. But then you use pallets. The pallet, which is that wooden structure on which you put cement, that pallet is regulated by this department because with that pallet, we may harbor a, a pest and get them unintentionally introduced. So we need to have a law that goes as far as that far-fetched example or far, far, uh, 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 the example of something that you wouldn't ordinarily think it exists. The hands I use the worst, worst case scenario of a cement uh, pallet, which sits on if or any other material product which sits on a wooden pallet that comes in. So I spoke of uh, establishment of the NPPOZA National uh, Plant Protection Organism of South Africa, and this is basically uh, uh, once that is in it would uh, or is introduced or referred provided for by the Act you will have those uh, units or those expertise uh, brought together to form a competent authority. Import control, this is of plant and plant products. This obviously I spoke to in, in the summary that we prevent establishment uh, or introduction of diseases and pests. Sometimes it's the disease, sometimes it's the pest, sometimes it's the diseases and pests. So it, any of the two has got to be controlled. National control, this basically uh, uh, where we, we say uh, anywhere in the country where agricultural production happens, we've got to be able to have a, 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 a legal standing or to be provided for by law to regulate that part. And we have, we've, have, we've done it before and we've been taken to court where we would have a disease of high economic importance uh, happening is classical case was in potatoes and we directed for uh, enabled by the pest, luckily because it was not uh, an imported 
So it was within the country. We've had directed that for the, the potatoes, uh, the whole production to be destroyed because we, we feared the introduction or the spread of that uh, uh, pest going uh, uh, to other areas where it does not nature, uh, naturally okay. Export control, like I said, the current Agricultural Pest Act does not make provision for export control. What is that? That doesn't make, make provision for us to say, you shall not export this to this country. In short, we do not, we not have that provision in our current law. And we are asking that we should be able to do that. And once the only enabling factor or to, to see if we then have a provision of the law to control export of plant and plant products is our ability to issue certificate. We are already issuing it, a fighter center certificate, uh, because like I said, we've got to ensure that we, we have had to make do with what we have and formulate our NPPO ZA, even though it is, is not provided for by our law, and we have because we, we couldn't export without the phytosanitary certificate that we are currently issuing. And re-export also, this, uh, this actually helps with economic growth. Uh, if, if one country uh, uh, requires products and we know we can access them, they can come to this country, be inspected, and be exported further to another country, basically. This happens in the main with seeds. It's easy for, for seeds uh, because of the shelf life, it happens already is a, is a lucrative business where uh, uh, seeds are imported into the country, uh, they get uh, checked, certified, and they can be exported to another country. Next slide. Thank you. This, I, don't, I, would, I wouldn't waste much time. Uh, basically, this is what we're saying. These are the, the, the definitions. Uh, very important is for section three, the powers of the minister to make regulation and control uh, measures uh, for you know so that the act uh, can the, the the how part of the act can be uh, implemented because uh, they would uh, there will be regulations that we need because we wouldn't want to put basic uh, administration or basic process processes and procedures in the act so you basically have the minister the act the provision section making provision for minister to promulgate uh, regulations and as and when uh, uh, the needs arise so that we can be able to control. And also uh, section four, uh, also the minister may prescribe um, measures which may be, may have got to be complied with by anybody. And at this moment, this is the area that we need to emphasize. We should be able to, to as much as uh, a production is enabled and can happen anywhere in the event of a, a, a disease or a pest, we should, minister should be empowered to be able to prescribe uh, uh, conditions under which such production can happen. And uh, also we, like I, I spoke of uh, us having had to, to eradicate or uh, the, 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 the clear off or, or the, the infested uh, potato farm at one point, but this get challenges because some already know the weaknesses in our current law and we get challenged. Hence, we need to strengthen that, especially section four. Next slide. Section five is in the main coming from the old act, but this is just uh, uh, amplified. Uh, this is that uh, makes provision for a registrar, executive officer or registrar. In this case, we call it the same, with the same functions as that of a registrar. Uh, that the minister uh, uh, designate a director within the department uh, for to become executive officer. This person uh, uh, implements the, the act uh, on behalf of minister and uh, minister, of course, the powers compared to uh, by section five are, are not divested. So the minister can still act upon them, but uh, for day-to-day -day running, you we would then have the executive officer running the or administering the act on behalf of the minister. This executive officer would be in the, the employ of the department. Section six, and basically it's about the powers, what the this person, executive officer, may or may not do, but in the main, it would be just uh, making sure that any section or provision of this act gets carried out by the executive officer on behalf of the minister. But the key part that we want to emphasize here is for the, the executive officer to have powers, legal powers 
to confiscate and control and, and destroy controlled goods. So, so, so if we hear of a truck uh, with bananas from another country or already consignment, this section, if we are sure that there are the one it has not been inspected or that we suspect it has it may have pests and diseases, we we we, we want that to be able to have that authority uh, enabled by the provision of this act to confiscate and destroy if needs be. And section seven, it is about the, the land which must be served in the in the preserved manner. Basically just to say what can happen where as far as production is concerned. So so this might uh, minister through we may through regulations and through a, an order just by of section seven, we may be we may prescribe, Minister may prescribe areas that are quarantine areas and movement from one area to the other may be restricted. This, all of this would be a, a, a processes of trying to uh, prevent introduction or spread of diseases and pests. Next slide. Search and seizure at the moment it happens, but we, it's not uh, uh, entrenched uh, and, and it's, not, it's not sufficiently entrenched in our, our law and we want it to be clearly uh, uh, entrenched and it be provided for so that we, we can enter. And we can in terms of section nine of the current, but it's not, it's not the, the wedding around it as, as members would know, the wedding of a, a section is what gives or takes a situation out of a situation, makes it's, it's what matters if it's if in any situation, in legal situation. So we, are, we then want to just make sure that the wedding there clearly stipulates what uh, the conditions under which the the executive officer uh, or or an assigned new of the executive officer can enter any premises, uh, search and uh, and uh, seize and and or or destroy. Uh, so so as long as that is pursuant to uh, pest or disease control, the I spoke of the NPPOZA uh, establishment by the sections eight nine. 9, 8, and 11, and then import regulations, section 12, basically that uh, in order to prevent, again, introduction of diseases. So we've got to uh, put conditions. If somebody wants to import, we're doing it, but it's not uh, sufficiently provided for in our law. We are doing all this on our members because it's what it's, it's, it's guided by the World Trade Organization uh, sanitary and phytosanitary committees and requirements. So we are we still are finding it uh, possible, but if challenged, uh, we may not be able to have a, a leg to stand on. Uh, uh, next slide. Import of regulated products. This is clear enough. This is what you want to um, amplify and make very clear. Uh, and we may be able to say this cannot be imported from any country. This is not tantamount to protection of growers. Uh, it, it's not, I mean, at front said, but this would go as far as disease and pest control is concerned, not, not economics. And regulated articles, this is clear to ensure that we comply with other countries. So we owe it to other countries, hence the export uh, part that uh, the, the 1983 Act did not make provision for. We now, we have, because we are operating within the realm of the WTO, World Trade Organization, uh, IPPC, we've got to be able to assure or make assurances to countries importing products of plant origin or, or, or plants. We have got to make to give that assurance that the, the, the products that we export into them uh, do not pose a phytosanitary danger to them or to that country. And in, in transit, that section 16, which is really a straightforward, just to make sure that uh, as members would know, most of the the uh, landlocked southern countries make import and export through our port of Durban. So there's a lot of in-transit uh, uh, imports and exports, uh, which you, as, as if you think of the, the port of Durban full of uh, during the citrus season, part of that, about 30% of that would be coming from other countries that include Zimbabwe. So, so, though, they, so, so, so though other countries might have ports, it might just be far for them, and the port of Deben, uh, also mindful of where the destination is, port of Deben becomes uh, uh, one of those prepared. So for that reason and other reasons, we've got to make safely be able to have 
measures in place to control um, uh, in transit, uh, export uh, or import. Next slide. We will from time to time in terms of section 17 declare regulated pests. This would not necessarily be quarantine pests, but would be pests of economic importance. So we would from time to time uh, ensure that we, 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 we check the situation, the, the, the agricultural situation in the country. And as the, the, the needs arise, we may uh, we, have, we, we want uh, to be enabled to, uh, by a provision of this act to be able to declare which pests are uh, regulated pests. It means uh, one of the things would be if the members ask, what do you mean regulated pests? So it becomes therefore law that upon uh, the discovery of a specific act, you should be able to report, you should report, and so that we know. And also you know, for states, because we know the damage is that the pest might cause, we then need to act proactively and be able to come in and control the pest, whether the farmer agrees for us to come and control the pest or not. If we know the pest can spread to other farmers, we need the surety in the law to be able to control it. This is the compulsory notification part, section 18 that I was referring to. The declaration of quarantine areas, this has, has spoken of assignment of powers. This is the, this, this section 22, one of the members, it's futuristic. It's, it's planned for a situation where there might just be so much to be done that the state might not be able to cope with. And in that specific case, minister may, uh, through in terms of section 22, um, uh, assign certain powers to a body organization or, or juristic or natural persons to be able to carry out the work of government. So, so this is just futuristic. We would prefer to keep it there because we don't want to, to uh, be found unprepared in the unlikely event of us being unable to perform any function. We want that to have that comfort that minister may assign a, another authority. It could be another department, it could be a municipality, it could be a private company, it could be a, 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 a juristic or natural person. Next slide. Section 28, very important. At the moment, I think it says, once uh, the current act says, if we find a, a traveler with apples in their bag, we must then go to magistrate and find the area of jurisdiction of where we find the person. The fine liable is around 300 rand. So that's not really deter uh, uh, infringements. So we then are through section 28, we want to align with other countries and be able to have fines issued. And, uh, and, and, and because that is evidence enough, also uh, jailing, uh, if, if needs be, uh, 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 transgressors could be jailed. But this is more about the fine that is deterrent enough for officials not to, to, know, to, to, to be tempted. I'm not, sorry, not official travelers, not to be tempted to bring this in the country. At the moment, we confiscate their, their products. We can only confiscate and destroy. We are not uh, uh, that much empowered. As members would know, the dogs, the canine unit that we keep there, we, we, before BMA, we used to run it. We used to have about uh, uh, 20 dogs. In, and each dog handler has got, each dog has its own handler, and they don't come cheap. So we, we, pre, we are providing a very expensive service but uh, we, we, we get nothing out of it. So that's basically the, the unfortunate cycle that we are, we are trying to correct because each, each, each K9 unit costs easily around 11,000 rand and an official who is a handler full time and up and down, let alone the medical and everything needs of the dog. But when we are found by that expensive dog with an apple, all we can do is take up the apple away from you. So that's not, that's not fair. This we spoke of section 30 regulations the compensation by minister in the event we would have had to come and destroy the, 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 the plantations, bananas, easy to do. In the event of virus, we can destroy that. Potatoes, a few diseases, there's a possibility of a compensation if we are able to check, to confirm that this uh, 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 infestation 
it's not as a result of any own doing by the owner. Those are the things, but those will the how part would be clarified if through in the form of regulations. Uh, this uh, cooperation just basically to the the executive officer that they needed by minister uh, by different authorities and parties in order to for for the for basically for the work of the executive officer to be easy uh, through section thirty two. Next slide, we're almost done. So these are the consultations. Like I said, on remember this bill has traversed all the way through. Um, everything ticking all boxes, but just couldn't be ascended into law owing to the changeover of the political cycle of government. Next slide. This were this with the consensus made. Next slide. They, we don't think we need more any more money to run this act. We, uh, like I said to in the beginning and throughout the presentation, we have been able to 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 make do with what we have. And we have been able to, in the main, uh, 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 implement the conclude? act. It's without Can we conclude? Yes, as I'm, this is the next one. Is the last one? Next slide. This is what uh, we, we 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 submit, uh, uh, honourable members, honourable chairperson. Thank you very much. I was checking uh, you on the platform. Yes, I was uh, speaking and I realized when you said chair that I was still muted. I thought I had unmute. Please proceed. <laughs> okay. No, thank you, chair. Yo. Let me greet you, Chair, and um, my colleagues and, and the officials on the platform. Chair, this is um, a piece of legislation that is important when you listen to this presentation. And uh, one would ask herself for a, why it took so long to come to this. Bearing in mind the importance that has been put before us on clauses that has to be amended and those that has to be brought in. Um, I wouldn't have any qualms with this bill and the presentation and motivation that has been put before us. I'm just asking myself, one thing about the control at the borders, Chair. Apparently, South Africa, we don't have scanners. If we have, they may not be enough. For uh, what is the department doing? Have they spoken to the department here, yeah, Foreign Affairs, on matters, the borders control? Because in many cases, like uh, that is Rahe is indicating, this is brought, brought through tourism. You go to Botswana, you see a plant is beautiful, you come with it and you pass through the border. Or have they tried to interact with their counterparts that are responsible for border control management? I know that uh, the minister responsible has been very vocal on issues of border management control. And this is another angle that is affecting us in this regard. And it will be proper to, for us to know if they have made contact or do they see the need to do that. To chair, <laughs> in as much as this will help, for sure it will ease the situation. I was just thinking loud here sitting where I am for a, 
this might work, but uh, just out of uh, interest in that, what do you do in cases like um, the pests that fly into our country? I'm thinking about the 2018 scenario of fall armyworm, or it was first seen somewhere central, Western Africa, and before we knew it, we were casualties the site. In that case, yeah, phytosanitary matters. How do you deal with such instances? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Tape. The Honorable Demasipa. Thank you and good morning, uh, colleagues. Uh, good morning, Chair. Um, thank you, Dr. <coughs> Sarare, on your presentation. Uh, Chair, I don't have much, but I just want to just make sure with regards to the consulted stakeholders, uh, was that done through public hearing or was it um, uh, done through just engagement or regarding the bill? And uh, if it was through public hearing, where is the advert of this particular you know, engagement with the stakeholders? The bill obviously took 10 years, Chair. And my worry is that if I look at the, the timeline that were presented here to us, and uh, specifically 2018 withdrawal of the bill in accordance with rule 334, to allow the portfolio committee in order to conclude on business before it ahead of the national election. So this bill is presented to us a year before the national election. Again, it's in May month. So this bill will probably also be withdrawn as such. So I just wanna understand why is this the bill been really dragging so much, you know, before it comes before the portfolio committee. <clears throat> and further, Chair, they talk about uh, the, uh, and uh, I talk about the engagement with uh, uh, a department. And just for example, you know, uh, this and that department. What about the, just giving us a list of all departments that were consulted, um, small business, obviously, um, like uh, Metlape has spoken about the home affairs, customs. I mean, we've got porous borders, you know. So while the bill is necessary, you know, our borders are not really helping much, especially uh, when it comes to uh, borders of Botswana, let, just, let me just say, around the SADC area and so forth what engagement has taken place to ensure that this bill is really enforced. Chair, the presentation talks about the, um, what you call the export control, uh, no provision for export control, re-export and in transit. Uh, you did indicate that you did a socioeconomic impact. When was it done? Uh, assessment it was 2020. Just a question, has that been presented to us? That's number one. Number two, what has been the cause uh, to, um, uh, to the country with regards to especially not having this particular provision on this particular bill? And Chair, I think we might, I mean, uh, I might have seen, this might have been presented, but it's too long ago. We definitely need to really uh, see the socio-economic impact uh, uh, engagement that was done with us. If it was done with us, I, I can't remember uh, being done, but I think it will be important so that that presentation uh, is done. Thanks, Chair. I think I um, covered all the issues that I thought uh, I will require some clarity. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable uh, Dr. Masipa. The Honorable Trader. Makaba. Ma 
normal chart hai the honorable kapa Jim. Paul Kappa. The Honorable Mamun Babama. Good morning, Chair, and everybody on the platform. Uh, Chair, I am covered on this one. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Mbabama. The Honorable Tate Matiasa. Tate Matiasa. The Honorable Memato. Memasho. Hello. Yes, please continue, Honorable Memasho. Chairperson, I I would like to say thank you very much for giving me the opportunity, but presently I have nothing to comment on. The, I just heard that the, the presentation was straightforward. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Memasho. Akpare Kruger. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I, I, I'm covered uh, by my colleague, um, Honorable uh, Masipa. However, um, I think we also need uh, to, to sit down and have discussions with the NCOP because I don't think um, the NCOP um, will be able to take all the balls through uh, in this term. So we must just make sure that we don't waste our time. Um, if the N NCOP indicates that they won't be able to, to give um, full complement to this bill, um, then we must rather um, let it stand over for the next um, um, term. So my proposal is um, be in, in, in conversation with the NCOP and, and then we can take it from there on. But I um, agree it's, it's time for a bowl such as this um, and, and we need to, uh, uh, you know, protect our plans in South Africa. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable uh, Kruger. Uh, the Honorable Ntate Muntuedi. The Honorable uh, Montuedi. Chair, my Israel local network. From my side, I'm okay, Chair Sharp. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Montuedi. Honorable members, is there any other honorable member on the platform who may wish to pose a question I have not recognized? Chair, you might have recognized me when my gadget was still disappointing me. But I wanted Please go to go ahead, Honorable Kappa. Thank you, Chair. But first, I wanted to add on what Honorable Kappa had said, because I was also concerned about non mention of the border management agency. And also, I think that going to get a clarity, maybe I missed this one that what happens when the pest, the department just discovered that the pest is already spreading in the country without knowing when it came and how it came, and then how is that one being handled? Then last chair, that is uh, just a minor one now. I noticed that on uh, section nine, when they were saying section nine, 10 and 11, and I think mistakenly they said section nine, eight, and eleven. I think that is a correction there. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Kapa. Uh, 
honorable members uh, i should have started uh, in the meeting by acknowledging our new member to the portfolio committee on agriculture land reform and rural development the honorable ubaus uh, to mozamini uh, from the anc sibalkulu you are most welcome to the portfolio committee and i see you have your hand raised you may proceed thank you very much uh, uh, our chairperson and indeed uh, because i was noticing that the chair was identifying everyone i had to indicate uh, but not to differ from what uh, the other members have said and uh, and i'm sure uh, the chair would have accepted my apology on the previous meetings i'm okay now chair but on on the discussion i support what other uh, members have said i thank you very much chair thanks thank you honorable bautlamini uh, um and you are most welcome to the portfolio committee on agricultural and reform and rural development honorable members any other honorable member on the platform who may wish to pose a question if not uh, allow me to also pose a question or two honorable members the bill was drafted when forestry was still part of this department it fell under and was part of agriculture as the bill refers to forestry which is now with environment one there be challenges in implementation of the bill once signed into law including conflicts with forestry and other legislation that is under environment secondly honorable members how has the department ensured that ordinary land users particularly communal and developing farmers were consulted and participated in the development of the bill according to the memo local consultation on the bill was limited to the national house of traditional leaders and national and provincial departments some government entities and industry bodies however section 18 of the bill makes it compulsory for land users or any person to report presence of regulated pests further honorable members section 28 of the bill makes it a punishable offense if a person does not report the presence of regulated pests will there be training of land users and owners about regulated pests including how to identify them and the reporting mechanism in the case of communal land honorable members who will be held liable if a regulated pest has not been reported and end up spreading or infesting other areas does the department honorable members currently uh, have enough capacity to carry out inspections on important consignments including all arrivals on ports of entry i e that being both land and air how many inspectors and k9 dogs are assigned to each port of entry in the country how many hours do these work in a day for example there are cases where international flights land at or tambo international airport at 5 am in the morning and i have not seen any of the k9 dogs at both or tambo international airport and cape town international airport that would be all on my side honorable members 
I see a hand of Ndadema Sipa. Chair, just, uh, um, I just want to um, apologize maybe uh, to the department. I understand that the bill was with us since 2021. It was not really the fault of the department. It was on our side. So I think the request for me really, Chair, on this one is that can we just have all bills that have been presented to us uh, that we need to um, go through before the close of this um, term of parliament. Thanks, Chair. Dr. you may proceed. Thank you, thank you. The we have lost that this Rafiche. Um I'm here, Honorable Chairperson. Sorry, thank you very much. My I because He's we had still here. challenges. As you members would have noticed, we had also I had, we were lost in one gadget, so we we, we log in with two gadgets. Uh, so hence I then had to have. I'm sorry, apologies for the feedback. Honourable uh, uh, members, the questions we captured them only at the time when Honourable uh, Kruger was on the platform. That's when the we lost the the the, uh, the connection. On this platform, honorable members, honorable chairperson, I'm with the Dr. Julian Yakta, who is the chief director responsible for plant production and health. I also have with us, we also have with us Mr. John Hendrik Fender, who's the director responsible for plant health. So the parts of the question that I may not have covered uh, with your indulgence, chairperson, please uh, uh, allow them to also uh, uh, come. After. So I'm going to scan through those that I've been able to capture and allow Dr. Yafta uh, 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 and uh, Mr. Fender to come in. The first question from Honorable Klape with regard to the, the uh, interaction with counterparts, yes, um, it has happened and uh, it can never be enough. Uh, Honorable members are aware that from the 1st of April, the borders, the control of uh, the all ports of entry now is the is the the responsibility of the Department of Home Affairs with the agency called Border uh, Border Management Authority. We work with them, and uh, we are about to conclude on the implementation protocol to ensure that they they are there and to ensure that they cover all the ports of entry. We monitor them. They still administer our law, so we we definitely will have to ensure that uh, uh, they have sufficient capacity and resources. We've had, uh, as part of preparing, preparing them to go, we, we basically also exceeded 272 officials that we used to have from the department. Those officials have been ceded to the Border Management Authority. So they will be forming part. So the Border Management Authority is not starting from a, a low base or a zero base. They start with officials that we already had and, and they are familiar with the work uh, the 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 the, the sanitary requirements at the ports of entry. These are not enough. Obviously, we will we will have to engage with them and them being an agency and them being able to generate uh, a, a, a revenue. We think they will be able to to have sufficient capacity where we were not as the department. Honorable Klapper also mentioned the the or asked the question about what happens uh, to pests that would fly. Yes. It's a very a, a good observation, Honorable Klappe. As a matter of fact, we see with the same problem with the uh, uh, locusts that fly over into other countries, neighboring countries. And as we always say, there's two things that don't know borders, pests and uh, fire, felt fire. So those uh, there are engagements at the moment. The last, uh, just around March, we were in Namibia. One of the things that we put forward was to have that collaboration starting with Namibia and other countries that we share borders with, so that uh, uh, they the, the would be able to detect pests before. If pests are detected towards the border, they will let us know so we can be ready. And we also will pledge to do the same. So it's a tricky one at the moment because uh, 
pests just, if they don't travel with us, try, tourists, they fly over. And it's true indeed, they do fly, as you have noticed with the, the, con the current control of uh, 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 locusts to be busy with it or the, the quillia beds. So if this is a, it's a correct observation that we, at the moment, are able to talk. The, 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 if we are able to control, they do not necessarily come in, but we have the other countries ready. Honorable Masipa uh, uh, mentioned or asked the question with regard to how the participation happened. And uh, we, we have consulted other departments. We may not necessarily have reached all other uh, 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 farmers because this will affect farmers. But uh, at some point, uh, and also Dr. Yafta and Mr. Fender will come in just to get with the specific as to where have we been able to go. But we were reliant uh, and, uh, because once the bill is with the PC, we stand ready to go and wherever the PC would want us to go. But I think the question is asking whether the previous PC has had time to take this to public participation. And my colleagues will get to the specifics at the study with Dr. Yafta immediately when I'm done with your indulgence, Chairperson. Uh, Ms. Honorable Masipa came again to uh, I was, I had Richard return there that 2021, not 2020. So it, honorable, yes, the bill has been before this current August uh, 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 committee. And your last question, honorable, Masipa, on all the bills that are before, we will certainly make uh, this, aware, uh, this committee aware of the bills that we would really plead that uh, something is done so that we, do, we don't have three political cycles going through one bill. And as members, who have already uh, uh, noticed uh, this is one of those very important bills that has got to be passed because uh, we are found wanting uh, and the, the, those that don't want to comply with the law, they know the weaknesses in our current act and can easily take us on. The CS uh, is a recent one. It will be shared uh, with, the, with the, the PC and um, the economic impact the CS does uh, 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 grant us and they've done the analysis so that they, they see us that grant us to go ahead and, and, and with the bill. We may not have the economic, done the economic assessment in terms of the figures of loss. Uh, we something that we will check if it can be done. We will rely. And since this, uh, uh, we'll be talking as of uh, uh, this void has been in existence since 1994, uh, it's, it, it's just a lot of money that uh, we may not be able to compute uh, sufficiently at this stage. And uh, Honorable uh, Puga, uh, 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 I, that's the time when, when you were talking, I missed that with your indulgence. Uh, I hope if Mr. Fender, uh, because Mr. Dr. Yafta and I are in the same building, so we're, we're locked off at the same time. I hope Mr. Fender was still on, so he captured Mr. Kruka's uh, question, Honorable Kruka's question. If not, we will with your indulgence plead that we, we get it again. And uh, Honorable Kappa, we, we, the, the Department of Home Affairs is now in charge of the ports of entry. And uh, we're going to be signing with them an implementation protocol. In that protocol, we're going to, in inverted commas, dictate, but basically we'll direct the, 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 the infrastructure that they have. This ties with the question by Honorable Clape about us having the resources uh, that are required uh, uh, to co perform a quarantine services function. You are right, Honorable Clape, we do not have sufficient, and the observation is true. So yes, Honorable Clape, we will have to do ensure that the, uh, the, the Border Management Authority is resourced. It, this is one of the reasons why some of the functions we see that in terms of section 97 by the president to go to border management authority, just so that they can consolidate and work together. Because at the moment, at the port, you have officials from agriculture, from health, from environment. So they're all over the place. So, so when they'll be in the control of the same department or the same authority, we think they will be able to share resources. And, and so yes, the issue of the scanners, in fact, we do not have for a country like ours, Honorable Kappa, Honorable Kappa, Country like ours, which with a with lot of uh, uh, land borders, has got to have what we call disinfecting uh, sprays for vehicles. Most of us know that other to Mozambique to go hunting, 
or fishing, they go on to farms, they farm in different, some are farming in Botswana and Namibia, they come. So it's easy for them to introduce a, a pest of quarantine importance or, or, or pest of economic importance. So yes, we've got to have the borders resource so that all vehicles coming in can be, other than just complying the vehicles themselves, will have to be uh, disinfectants. That's one of the requirements that we made to the border management authority. Um, what happens when a pest directly, yeah, but yes, the same thing. If, if it happens that uh, if, uh, a pest is introduced, unfortunately with the current situation, we may not be able to know, but we will, as soon as uh, we, we finalize our implementation pro protocol with the border management authority, we should be, is be able to, to then have all ports of entry, uh, air, land, and all other sea, uh, ports uh, 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 equal, uh, sufficiently capacitated and sufficiently resourced for them to be able to take care of uh, uh, unintended uh, introduction of pests. In the Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Mandela, the bill, yes, um, we left it as is, and uh, it's uh, one of the matters that we left to correct. It still refers to forestry, and one of the things that we will uh, immediately attend to is to uh, ensure that uh, the, all references to forestry are, are, are removed and uh, so, so that uh, it uh, refers to uh, agricultural land reform and rural development. How were ordinary members consulted? I can honestly send here and say not sufficiently, but the bill is, is tax 76. So, so one assumes you would then be able to have that opportunity. Uh, we may have uh, 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 consulted farmer organizations, but uh, we may not have had sufficient uh, sessions with the farmers, actual farmers that uh, may not be aware. And as Honorable Chair has correctly pointed out, it, it places the responsibility on all farmers. So it's very, it's only fair that we go to them and make them aware of their responsibility in terms of the provisions of this bill once enacted. The, uh, uh, who will be liable if it, it's a case of communal land? Yes, uh, the intention uh, and the hope is that you don't get to that because a uh, pest of quarantine importance or quarantine pest should not even be detected. And if anything, if our ports and, and our quarantine services work as this as per design at the ports, we shouldn't have any quarantine pest introduced. That way, then pest of economic importance, We the question with Honorable Mandela is about our ability as the department to be able to assess and be able to tell, detect pests before they get uh, uh, uncontrollable. Yes, the question is, do we have sufficient capacity? We do, and nothing can ever be 100% ever sufficient. At the moment, we do what we call surveillance. We put traps at port of entry, at strategic areas throughout the country, so that we are able to detect the presence of pests. The good thing with pests is that they, they, they do not become pro problematic at all their stages, this all stages of their life. So if we're able to uh, pick up pests early enough, we're able to control them before they become uh, 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 destructive. So we have traps that we set around uh, with different countries, I mean, different parts of the country, different provinces, different uh, cities, uh, taxi rank, bus rank. We just have to be sure that we we increase that surveillance. We rely on surveillance up to this so far, Honorable Mandela, to be able to detect and uh, know areas that we need to intensify control. Uh, resources can never be enough, but so far, yes, we are able to, to do uh, uh, and control. And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yafta. If you may, with your indulgence, Chairperson, the past that I may not have uh, sufficiently covered and uh, the Mr. Fender will also with the indulgence of Chairperson to cover areas that I might have missed. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Thank you, um, Mr. Saraf, and good morning um, to the honorable members on the platform. Um, there are just two uh, areas that I would like to cover. The, just to add to what Mr. Saraf has said in terms of the question from Hon Honorable Klape as to the pests that do fly around, um, that enters the country. Mr. Sarah did mention that we we do collaborate with other uh, with other authorities, um, but in a, in our country we also have um, uh, the emergency plant pest response plan, which is a very detailed 
and consulted plan that we have developed with um, all of the stakeholders, which details all of the, the relevant actions that we may and have to undertake as and when we have an emergency pest breakout, which obviously, as in the case for, for when a pest do fly into the country and it is uh, a pest of quarantine concern that we can invoke uh, this, 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 this plan. And then also um, we, we do also, as part of our interaction with other authorities, um, we do we have examples of projects that we are currently managing with some of our, our neighbors with, with international involvement um, to, 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 to deal with this of, of common concern amongst, amongst these countries. <clears throat> the, the question from Honorable Masipa with regards to public hearings, um, we, the, the, the previous portfolio committee did not undertake any uh, public hearings, um, despite it have, having reached the portfolio committee back then, we, we never had an opportunity like we have now to make a first presentation However, in developing developing the bill, we we had uh, we undertook a national workshop um, to to consult and to um, solicit inputs, and then there was also a formal publication in the government gazette um, through which we've also solicited inputs, and those inputs have also been summarized and was part of our uh, social economic impact assessment report. Uh, but the department can again make, make it formally of a, a summary of the comments and how we've responded to those comments. We can make again available um, to 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 to, um, to the committee. Then, unfortunately, chairperson, the only uh, input that I heard from Honourable Creer was that uh, we need that the committee needs to consult with the NCOP to determine whether all the bills that still needs to go to the NCOP will also be able, to, that NCOP will be able to deal with it. But if there was a specific question that we've missed, if Mr. Fenter that did not cap capture it, Chair, I think we would appreciate if, if that question could be repeated. Those are the only items that I would like to uh, reply to. Thank you so much. With your indulgence, Chairperson, Mr. Fender, have you picked anything that we missed? Um, thank you, Mr. Sarahi. Honorable members, um, I may have only one, one um, aspect I want to just make clear um, and for clarifying that is indeed, as Mr. Sarahi indicated, that there is a, the, the, the bill still refers to forestry, but we must also remember that forest plants or trees are plants. Therefore, they, the importation of, of forestry seed and um, seedlings, as well as uh, the control of pests in forestry, um, we, it still is um, covered by this bill bill. But yes, in terms of, of departmental alliance, then we may have to make an amendment um, if, uh, if that is not clear. Um, so I, I just want to catch that. Um, and then maybe just one other thing that I forgot now, and that was the, the question on um, communal land or who is responsible. The bill focus on land users um, and for, for out the... the um, that's the same in the current um, Act, the Agricultural Pest Act, and those consultations to, uh, and training or awareness actions are, there's a unit in, the, um, in, in our department who is dealing with these type of alerts and awareness to train um, growers of, on, on the, from, from subsistence up to commercial growers on how to identify or detect these pests. And uh, you would recall the the the, the, the introduction of full army women in South Africa. Um, South Africa is one of the countries in uh, in the world or currently being being recognised for our quick actions uh, through our emergency response team and the quick 
uh, of our ability to very quickly set up a steering committee dealing with the space specifically and get to the public on awareness on how to identify this space and how to tr treat your your land your maze which was mainly attacked with it of course there was still um, some damage and we, one can never avoid that but um our our uh, structure was of such that it already helped us tremendously in a quick response thank you thank you uh, honorable chair honorable chairperson we submit thank you Thank you, Dr. Serrache. I see the hand of Honorable Kruger is up. Thank you, um, Chairperson. Um, I just want to make a proposal that, um, uh, and um, the NCOP are very serious about um, not going through all the bills um, that's all of a sudden um, coming to NCOP. So I want to propose that um, we invite the NCOP to um, come and make a presentation and see if all these um, bills are, you know, uh, if they have time to, 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 to work through all these bills that we want to send through to the NCOP. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, uh, Dr. Krug and Dr. Masipa. Chair, um, I think I'm answered on the, the question of uh, the public participation, but I'm still not very clear, Chair, as to when this public participation uh, took place. And I'll assume that it might have taken place during the fifth term or the previous term, if I'm correct. My concern is that uh, the that particular public participation was done under the different, obviously, the Department of Agriculture uh, combined with forestry and fisheries at the time. Uh, I do not know what is the procedure, but I'll definitely think that uh, the department will still probably be required to gazette this bill before we can obviously, you know, um, go through it and uh, get some inputs from the public because I think when it was uh, gazetted at the time, it was gazetted obviously as uh, forestry, agriculture, forestry and fisheries at the time. So uh, I will be guided by you, but I will still think that uh, uh, we might be short circuiting the process or we might also have to seek legal advice. I'm also uh, aware of the inputs that uh, Honorable Kruger is making right now, which I think uh, we we obviously uh, do get our ATC, but I think we definitely need to, as a committee, we need to talk about the bills that are at hand and see how best we can work with them, because I don't think we have got much time. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Ntadjo Masipa. Honorable members, one of the identified constraints was the budget. And... Uh, inadequate resources. At the time of the CISIS uh, in 2013, the total cost for the bill were estimated at about 5 million, at about 50 billion rands per annum. And uh, uh, 30 million rands of the total was for quarantine pest surveillance, implementation and enforcement. I therefore want to understand that this does the department think the total amount will be sufficient in light of the biosecurity challenges that we have as a country? Most concerning is the fact that the biosecurity sub-program, which covers both plants and animals, will only get an average of about 4.5 million per annum over the medium term. So how does the department plan to implement the bill without resources? If we can have responses to those questions so we can move on to the next presentation. Thank, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Yes, you, you are right, Honorable Chair. We do not have funds. Funds are not never enough. 
we we've budgeted for this, but it's never enough. And the industry comes on to assist also uh, for the entire biosecurity work. We require biosecurity as members know uh, covers the animals and plant and their diseases. So so we we've budgeted for it, but it may not be enough. And uh, we 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 hope when the the structuring process, uh, fit for purpose structure of the department, that we will be allocated sufficient resources. Uh, there are engagements with Treasury. We hope for that. For at the moment, on a project visit, no, we do not necessarily have enough, but we have made that strides to allocate what we have, just so we can have this very important bill uh, passed, so that we can then be able to uh, see what we can uh, do. Yes. The bill also it's makes provision up, for assigning. Of reason Honorable Baul Ramini, please mute your microphone. Honorable Baul Ramini, please mm -hmm. mute your microphone. You may proceed, Dr. Sarahe. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Yes, funds, like in short, we, we can never have enough, but we, with the budget that we've made available, we think we can, once the bill pa is passed, uh, send them to law, we can manage reasonably well, but we will require more resources. And this bill makes provision for assignment. So a minister, minister may assign. That is just a cushion for in the event we need to get extra assistance. But unfortunately, that comes at extra costs. And we've seen the industry uh, basically repelling uh, uh, any such moves of appointing assignees. But yes, in short, so far, we, 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 we are fairly well, doing well. We've commissioned a study for the cost of the lack of or, or insufficient biosecurity in the whole country. We may share with that, uh, we're working with the Western Cape Department of Agriculture. Once that's done, we may share with that is going to conduct an analysis of the entire country uh, 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 threats, uh, biosecurity threats. So we'll see that uh, report will give us an idea of which areas require uh, additional funding. Uh, thank you, thank you. And the others from Monopoly Prior and Monopoly Masipa, those are basically for, I think, for procedural and purposes. We are willing, we're ready. If this August committee wants us to go on a, a, a public participation or consultation, we are ready. All we are pleading is for the bill to go through within still possible, if possible, this uh, the political cycle because we've waited for long and uh, 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 our clients are already aware of the loopholes in our current law. We submit your question. Thank you. Thank you, honorable members. Uh, that is uh, the presentation and responses from the Department of Agriculture and Reform and Rural Development. We will now uh, move on to the second presentation, honorable members, on our agenda, so that we may be able to uh, finish on time. I am uh, looking uh, at uh, time as we progress and uh, would like us uh, to set aside the presentation and uh, the responses that we've received for the plant health financiary bill and we will now move on to the these registries amendment bill can i invite the uh, honorable members the officials of the department to put up the presentation on the deeds registries amendment bill and they may proceed chair point of order Yes, and Dr. Masipa. I think uh, I made a, a um, call it um, an input with regards to the gazetting of this bill or the uh, public participation. And Sarare um, answered back to say that it's up to us. I thought Chair will probably just summarize and make a ruling in this regard. Thank you. We'll revert back to you. Let us proceed. Uh, that the uh, and the officials of the department on the presentation, as I will have closing remarks at the end of the meeting. Um, good morning, honorable chairperson, honorable members of the committee. Uh, my name is Antoinette Reynolds. Um, 
I'm from the Office of the Chief Register of Deeds, and I will present um, the Deeds Registries Amendment Bill. Um, Uh, the objectives of the bill is to amend the Deeds Registries Amendment Act, uh, uh, the Deeds Registries Act, my apologies, that's Act 47 of 1937, and that is to streamline certain administrative provisions and to provide for uh, the recordal of land tenure rights by a register of deeds in the Deeds Registries, and to further regulate the powers of the minister and that of the Deeds Registries Regulation Board, and to also um, amend uh, the um, composition of um, um, the board, and to extend the applications of waivers of preferences of real rights over land, and to introduce further punitive measures regarding deviant conduct in Deeds Registries. Now, clause one um, of the bill seeks to amend section two of the Deeds Registries Act, and section two deals with the appointment um, um, of the chief registrar of deeds, uh, the appointment of registrars and assistants and deputy registrars of deeds. Now, um, these appointments are affected in terms of the Public Service Act. Um, however, it is um, uh, um, not clear from the act. Um, the impression is um, there that the, these appointments are affected in terms of the Deeds Registries Act. So this section two will now be amended to make it clear that the appointment of these officials are indeed affected under the Public Service Act of 1994. And also it will make it clear that these officials do have to have the qualifications as is recognized by the Minister of the Department of Public Service and Administration. Um, clause two um, also provides for the insertion of a new section two capital A, two capital B and two capital C. And that is necessary because the act does not fully address the role that the chief registrar of deeds is playing in the branch deeds registration. So section two will, A will now be inserted to deal with the appointment of the chief registrar of deeds. Those um, section uh, two, one, uh, those will be removed and it will be now um, inserted in the new two A. And 2B will be inserted uh, to deal with the responsibilities of the Chief Registrar of Deeds. That is, for instance, um, to, um, to head the management of the deeds registration, legislation, litigation, and deeds training services, as well as the deeds uh, registration ICT uh, services, amongst others. And 2C will be inserted to um, deal with the duties of the Chief Registrar of Deeds. That is, for instance, um, that the um, uh, CRD act as chairperson and executive officer of the Deeds Registries Regulation Board and of the um, Sectional Titles Regulation Board. The uh, Chief Registrar of Deeds must, for instance, also um, um, uh, develop and maintain the electronic deeds registration system, which is now um, uh, as contemplated in um, the Electronic Deeds uh, Registration Systems Act. Act 19 of 2019. Now clause three of the um, bill um, aims to amend section three of the Deeds Registries Act. And section three um, speaks to the duties of um, the Register of Deeds. Um, and now the Act does not currently provide for the recordal of land tenure rights in a Deeds Office. It provides for the registration of land and real rights in land. So there's a need now to insert a provision in section three that um, provide mechanisms for the recorder of land tenure rights um, that have been created and lawfully issued under other law. And there's also a need to insert a section 31C ter to provide for the noting of the conversion to full ownership of such rights in compliance with the requirements of law. So they need to be enabling law. If you, for instance, think of the um, Upgrading of Land Tenure Rights Act, Act 112 of, two, of, of um, 2019, it provides for, um, um, in section two, for the creation of certain uh, land tenure rights, and specifically in section two, two of that act, it provides for the register of deeds to note um, um, a, a title deed and to note its records 
with regard to the upgrading of those rights into full ownership. For instance, to do so without the lodgements of transfer duty certificates, etc. So in this case, it will be exactly the same. The register of deeds will be um, in a position to record land tenure rights once there is other legislation that, uh, that places such a duty on the registrar and provides then, of course, for the creation um, and the recordal of those rights um, in the enabling legislation. Clause 3b also deals with the amendment of Section 31i uh, of the Act. Now, Section 31i of the Act provides for a registrar of deeds to register uh, waivers of preferences in respect of registered real rights in land over mortgage bond. However, there's also now a need to provide for the registration of waivers of preferences in respect of registered real rights in favor of leases. Now, this amendment in Section 31I will address this need. Now, as an example, I can mention, for instance, where I inherit a farm from my father and in my father's um, a testament in the will, he, for instance, um, 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 uh, left a uh, usufruct over the farm in favor of my mother. Now that usufruct will be then registered as a real right over the title deed of the farm to protect her right. And then when I, for instance, want to go and, 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 and obtain a mortgage bond, let's say I want to mortgage a 5 million rand over a bond over the farm, then APSA can ask that my mother um, waives preference of her registered real right of that usufruct in favor of the mortgage bond. And that bond will then be registered free from um, that usufruct. Now here is now um, a proposed amendment for the same, uh, um, the waiver of, of, of that usufruct, for instance, in favor of a lease, where I want to register a long-term lease, let's say of 10 years over the farm, then the uh, lessee and my mother can agree. It's a, a voluntarily agreement that my mother then waives preference of her real right in favor of the lease. And the lease is then uh, registered free um, from that usufruct. So a waiver of preference is a voluntarily agreement whereby one holder basically exchanged the preference. He does not lose it. He just exchanged the preference that he enjoys over property. Um, in favor of another holder. Then clause five of the bill deals with the um, amendment of section nine. And section nine deals with the establishment of the deeds registries regulation board. So it has become necessary now um, to um, uh, seeing that the deeds registries branch operates on a, a business account. Um, we, for instance, charge um, office fees for the um, issuing of deeds registration information. And we also charge fee for a registration of deeds and documents. Now, um, with regard to that, and also in view of the development, uh, we're currently um, um, busy with the development of the electronic deeds registration um, system um, as per the um, electronic deeds registries, um, state, uh, electronic deeds registration systems act, act 19 of 2019. We are um, engaged with the development of that system. Now, in view of that, um, it has become necessary to have members on the board that um, are expert on financial matters and also expert in respect of ICT matters. So um, the um, um, act is now to be amended to provide for membership of a chief financial officer and the office of the uh, chief register of deeds, as well as a chief financial officer at national treasury and then the chief director um, at ICT at the office of the chief registrar of deeds, um, just to bring that um, expert knowledge onto um, the board. In uh, clause six of the deal, um, uh, bill deals with the amendment of section 10 of the Deeds Registries Act. Now section 10 contains a list of matters in respect of which um, the minister may make regulations. Now, the proposal for the amendment is to provide for um, regulations to be made uh, with regard to the collection of information pertaining to personal information relating to race, gender, citizenship, and nationality of landowners in South Africa. Now, um, this um, uh, information will be captured 
into um, uh, registers by uh, um, uh, deeds office um, uh, data capturers. And this information uh, will only be um, available to state departments uh, of a national or provincial fear of government. It will not uh, be available to the general public. And this information will also then assist us in compiling more accurate land audit reports um, in future regarding the transformation of land ownership in South Africa. Then clause 10 of the bill um, deals with the amendment of section 99 um, of the act. Now section 99 deals with the exemption from the liability um, for acts um, and um, of omission um, um, and deeds offices. So the act as it currently reads, it does provide for a register of deeds and official in the deeds office to be found guilty of an act um, or an omission, um, and that they are then liable to make good any loss to the government in instances where such acts or omission um, was more life fide. So the proposed amendment to section 99 now seeks to provide for a penalty of a fine or imprisonment in respect of these more life fide acts um, and omission by a registrar um, um, or an official in the deeds office, and also for other people for other persons, for instance, your conveyances uh, and your notaries that may be part of a collusion to such Malay Free Day Acts and omissions. And this is basically just to um, um, curb, uh, to prevent fraudulent uh, transactions from getting registered in uh, these registries. Clause 12 um, of the bill, uh, that deals with the amendment of the definitions um, in the Deeds um, Registries Act, which is found in section 102 of the Act. And this amendment provides for, um, 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 it inserts a definition of attorney, and it also provides for the amendment of the definition of a conveyancer and the definition of notary public. Uh, insofar, it will then enable a notaries in, and conveyances and um, attorneys that are in the employee of the department to prepare and execute deeds and documents in respect of uh, transactions relating uh, to state land. Then um, the last clause is uh, clause 13. Now clause 13 um, provides for um, 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 the amendment of the Electronic Deeds Registration Systems Act, that is Act 19 of 2019, to the extent um, as it's it set out to a schedule to the bill. Now, this um, EDRS Act, um, as I mentioned, it provides for uh, the preparation and the lodgement, registration and execution of deeds to be affected um, electronically. But um, due to the Act now, Section 3, the duties of the registrars of deeds to be amended to enable a register of deeds to attend to the recordal of land tenure rights, it is now also necessary to amend uh, the EDRS Act also to provide for the electronic recordal of those um, uh, um, um, transactions in uh, the deeds office. And um, it is therefore necessary that um, this act be amended um, then to provide um, for um, electronic recordals in a deeds registry. Um, um, that's the last slide. I can just mention that um, um, the bill was attacked as a, nine, uh, um, as a, a, a 75 bill. Um, at it, um, the department did receive. Um, Honorable members, that. please mute your microphones. Please the mute your microphone. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, the department um, did also receive exemption from the application of a socioeconomic impact assessment study, and that is due to the technical nature of the of the bill, and also um, that it doesn't introduce any new policy um, position. Um, uh, yes, sir. that's all from my side. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mamu Antoinette Reynolds. Um, honorable members, there's the presentation on the deeds registries and amendment bill. Uh, We'll now open the session for questions of clarity uh, and comments. Honorable Kabe. 
<laughs> Thank you, Chairperson. Um, thanks, uh, the Department, for this presentation on this uh, bill. Chair, I think um, we should welcome this because, um, as the presentation is saying, the proposed amendments are intended to bring the principal act in line with formal requirements and transformatory land reform measures. However, Chair, I just want to check on the issue of uh, financial implication because uh, the memorandum indicates there's no financial implication on this one. So I'm sitting and thinking of the cost of developing and implementing the new systems and how are they going to be covered? And uh, I think the department should be able to say to us, how are they going to consider the issue of uh, social economic impact assessment and quality assurance of this bill, which then provides for details on the benefits and cost, cost implications. Chair, clause three also of this bill proposes an amendment of section three of the act by extending the duties of the registrar to record the land tenure rights that have been recognized or in future will be recognized by law. But while this uh, principle is a good provision, it has a potential of providing security of land tenure for people that do not have. The concern here is that there's no legislation that provide mechanisms and procedures for the registration and recordal of rights in land, including but not limited to customary, informal and communal forms that are to be recorded by the register of deeds. Now, considering this um, limited capacity within the department to process legislation, it may take many years before this provision becomes applicable. So can we check with the department whether it's not advisable to pass legislation that determines how land tenure rights are established before including this provision in the bill? Because given the complexity of unregistered rights as well as existing conflicts around ownership and access to land, as the committee has seen in Guaju, the record of rights without a clear communal land tenure policy might expose these registries to endless litigation and conflict management. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Kappe. Can we remove the presentation of the screen so we can enable uh, to see the members as they raise their hands? Honorable Tatema Sipa. Uh, thank you, Chair. Chair, there's... Uh few uh, concerns that were raised by the uh, law society and other that made submission, other institution that made submission to the department in terms of the bill as they see it. And one of the concerns that was raised, raised was that uh, the removal of the power of the deeds register regulation board to make any actual uh, regulations. So I just want to know um, if uh, those uh, submissions were considered and uh, obviously taken into account and uh, if there has been changes that were made. And I will read the concern that was really raised by um, the, uh, the Law Society that concerns are that politicians are going to take charge of day-to-day -day technical management of highly technical business on recording who owns what. So this is one of the major uh, submission that was made. And there's also on clause three, uh, amending section three of the principal act where it states that clause three of the bill proposes an amendment of section three of the deeds registry act by extending the duties of the registrar one of which is to record land tenure rights while we have no problem with this principle with the principle of this we believe that before this duty is passed on to the registrar legislation should be passed as to how land tenure rights which now have to be be recorded 
by the registrar of deeds are to be established. Uh, there are currently various forms of land tenure rights, some of which are probably capable of easy determination and recordal, and some of which would probably be very difficult to establish and record. It is of concern that the registrar of deeds could be bogged down dealing with dubious or unclear rights or become involved in litigation in respect of matters which are somewhat vague. So these are some of uh, uh, the, the concerns that were raised, but there are a number of them. I just want to hear from the department if all the submissions were taken into account and what was the determination? Has there been any amendment or change in terms of the drafting of those amendments that they were busy with after the Law Society and others have made their submissions? Thanks very much, Chair. Thank you, Honorable uh, Dadema Sipa, the Honorable Kappa. Thank you very much, Chair. Let me also join in uh, uh, welcoming and appreciating the, the, the presentation of this amendment. Just a small clarity also, Chair, <clears throat> that uh, just to find out if are there no uh, pieces of legislation that had existed under the TBVC states that may not have been appeal repealed, that may be affecting this process of uh, amendment. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Kappa. The Honorable Tate Matias. Tate Matias. The Honorable Mamun Babama. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you to the department for um, this presentation. Um, Chair, I don't want to repeat some of the questions that my colleagues have asked. Um, so I will just go to a few that are left after they have done their um, input. The first one, Chair, has the department adequately explored um, the corresponding implications of the recordal of land rights? I was just reading an article by Professor Ben Cousins based on a reputable research that estimated that in 2011, some 1.5 million people lived in FDP houses with inaccurate or outdated title deeds, mostly due to transfers not recorded in the deeds office. And then another 5 million lived in FDP houses where no titles had been issued due to systemic inf um, inefficiencies. Now, along with 1.9 million people living in backyard shacks, 2 million on living on farms belonging to others, and 17 million in communal areas, uh, giving us a total of about plus minus 30 million people, which is nearly 60% of the population. Now, all of these people will need to be uh, serviced by this uh, amendment that we are making in clause three. And I'm wondering if this amendment can realistically uh, secure the land rights of all these people. I feel that it will really be a lot of work for the, um, for the DIS office. And I'm wondering if we are ready for that. And also Chair, um, has the department adequately explored the corresponding implications of the recorder of land rights in, uh, for instance, the interplay and interdependence of various pieces of legislation uh, between other government departments and their entities. Also, has the department explored the practicability of, of uh, recording these rights, especially where surveying of the land is concerned? Does the existing deeds office have the capacity to implement recorder of the rights and how is this uh, envisaged to be done? I also ask, have the traditional authorities um, who at present have custody of the informal land, land been adequately consulted on this amendment? And then um, I also ask 
um, what is the justification for removing the power of making regulations from the board to the minister. Thank you very much, Chair. That's all from me. Thank you, Honorable Mbabama. The Honorable uh, Memato. Memato. Honorable Chair. Hello. Yes, Mama, we can go ahead. Thank you very much. Let me take this opportunity and thank you, Chair. Our ministers, present deputy ministers, my colleagues, our officials of the department. Let me also welcome the presentation as presented. Chair, without waste of time, I would like to align myself with uh, the, 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 the input made by Honorable Tape. Uh, of which I'm not going to repeat what she said. I think she covered me in, in, in most of what I wanted to ask. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Kruger. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I was also covered by uh, my two colleagues. Thank you, Chair. Akbar Ebriet. Thank you, Voorzitter. Chairperson, I am also covered. Thank you so much. Thank you. Dr. Muntoedi? Eh, Mudula Stilo, eh, Madume, Huena, Lebatana Kopanamboti. Thank you, Chair. Cha just a quick one on my side. I, it may, I may be wrong by this observation, but I have a feeling that the bill is taking powers of making regulations from the board to the minister. I just want to find out why is that the case? Uh, and then uh, I think my, my colleagues have covered the issues of the recordal of rights chair. Uh, but on my side, which I also agree that is a bit problem, not a bit, it's very problematic. I just want to check if does this include communal areas in the former bank to stand chair? And then uh, maybe the other thing that one may, may just throw in there chair is that what is the guiding registration on how the process to record the rights will be followed uh, in terms of who then qualifies? Uh, and, and, and these are not matters, Chair, that can be left to be dealt in the regulations, Chair. Now, the last thing, Chair, on my side is that uh, where there are disputes, how will the dis resolve this? And then uh, who will facilitate the recording of rights uh, in terms of conveyances or officials in the department, Chair? I'm much more in a stronger network now. Yeah, and we can hear you much better now. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Montredi. Honorable members, any other honorable member on the platform? Baus Tumo. Sibalko. Chepesin, I am covered by the uh, members who uh, the, I mean, starting with the with what Thap was saying, I am fully covered. Thanks very much, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Zamini. Uh, Any other Honorable member who I have not recognized who may wish to pose a question? Thank you, Honorable Members. Uh, I'm going to take the opportunity to pose uh, a series of questions that I have on my side. As uh, I have uh, listed a few uh, questions uh, which uh, may go as follows. Uh, they can be categorized under four themes, namely, one being procedural questions in relation to tagging. Secondly, it will be a registration of power of attorneys. Thirdly, the composition of the deeds registries, regulations board. And fourth, and lastly, the recorder of land tenure rights. In terms of uh, tagging of the legislation, uh, given the question of record of land tenure rights that have been allocated by government or by any competent authority, 
Does this include land rights allocated under indigenous or customary law by traditional authorities, armor corps, or leaders in rural communities? We are also we also know, honorable members, that Section 76 bill is any bill whose provisions is substantial measure fall within a functional area listed in Schedule 4 of the Constitution. If you look at the areas listed included, uh, amongst others, indigenous law and customary law, as well as traditional leadership, what lessons can we draw from the Tohwane matter or the Clara judgment, especially on the questions of substance and purpose and effect? Since there is no longer, uh, since there is no other legislation, at least in my knowledge, honorable members, dealing with the issue of clarification or adjudication of rights unregistered and informal land rights. Does this bill not imply that these issues will be dealt with under this bill? In short, do you consider the Deeds Registries Amendment Bill as an ordinary bill that does not affect the provinces? And regards with power of attorneys, honorable members, Clause 3, uh, Clause 3C and uh, U of the bill provides for changes in the registration of powers of attorneys. What is the rationale behind this provision? What is the department trying to address or correct with the proposed amendment? I raise this issue because sometimes we find ourselves legislating for internal inefficiencies of the department or opposed to legislative gaps or weaknesses. In regards to the deeds registries regulation boards, honorable members, the bill takes away the powers of the deeds registries regulation board to make regulations. It gives the powers to the minister who acts on recommendations of the board. What are the challenges with the current provisions where the board could make regulations? In what ways is this change going to improve the deeds registry system? The number of uh, members appointed by the minister increases from four to seven. What are the reasons for this increase? Were there, are any, were there any challenges experienced? The bill also does not include the Chief Surveyor General in the names of the seven members of the board. Why is that? We know that the South African deed system is underpinned by cadastre, a key function of uh, surveyors. In my view, this is particularly important because of a proposal to introduce a recorder system, especially recorder of unregistered informal rights. Last but not least, honorable members, is that of recorder of tenure rights. Can anyone in Mveso, where I'm from, approach the deeds registries to apply for recordal of rights under the term of this legislation. In some cases, unregistered rights in traditional communities are not individualized. These rights sometimes are vested at the level of family and enjoyed by all members of the family. In other cases, tenure rights are communally held, for example, grazing rights, on communal land, how are these rights going to be recorded? In other words, what policy or legislation guides us in this process? We know that in some cases, unregistered land rights are not surveyed 
and there is no mapping. In some cases, it leads to land disputes about who owns what rights on what piece of land is clarified. Whilst recordal of rights is a noble initiative, there are fundamental questions about clarification and confirming the rights as well as mechanisms to deal with the disputes. Can the department inform us as the portfolio committee which legislation deals with these matters? I note that the bill empowers the minister on the basis of recommendations of the Deeds Registries Regulation Board to make regulation with regard to the forms of applications, certificates, registers, and other documents to use in connection with the recordal of land tenure rights. This is problematic, honorable members, because as I said, there is no legislation, no policy to guide this complex system of clarifying unregistered tenure rights. Firstly, who can apply for recordal of rights? What are the requirements? I'd like to request honorable members that the department explain the provisions in clause 3.1, uh, no, in clause three, which I am interested to understand the following. Do land tenure rights lawfully issued by any competent authority include tenure rights issued by traditional authorities in terms of customary law or indigenous law? As I said before, should we not pass the communal land tenure rights bill or communal land tenure policy before we pass this amendment? or recordal of rights? Does the registration of the conversion of land tenure rights to another form include conversion from customary tenure rights to leases as seen under the Ingonyama Transport? If it does, is the amendment not legalizing what the court has already ruled unlawfully? Similarly, honorable members, does the registration of conversion of land tenure rights to another form of tenure rights include issuing of title deeds to residents on communally owned land under traditional councils and traditional authorities? That would be all on my side. Thank you, honorable members. We will now hand over to May Reynolds to take us through the responses. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Um, um, to answer um, the question of Honorable Member Klape with regard um, to the financial implications, um, um, the um, object memo um, and, uh, states that there is no financial implications. And a uh, member then wanted to know what about uh, the development of the electronic deeds registration system. Now, I can just mention when we did um, go through the parliamentary processes with regard to the, um, the Electronic Deeds Registration Systems Act, that's Act 19 of 2019, um, and Section 2 of that Act has been um, enacted, it has been promulgated, and Section 2 of the EDRS Act provides for the Chief Register of Deeds to develop and to maintain the Electronic Deeds Registration System. Now, whilst we were busy uh, with that act, we did do a socioeconomic impact assessment study. So that was done. But I must just mention that uh, the deeds registries um, 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 function on um, um, a deeds trading account. So we create our own fees with regard to the registration of deeds and also the supply of deeds registration information. So uh, the board, the Deeds Registries uh, Regulation Board sits annually and they also come um, with, um, they discuss um, Section 18, um, uh, 84 of the um, uh, regulations to the Act, which contains the schedule of fees. And um, um, it is increased um, every year and it also goes to National Treasury for approvement. 
and also um, uh, monies uh, um, from the, this trading account is being used to develop um, uh, the EDRS and there is sufficient funds for the development and nationally, uh, a national treasury also allows the department to keep behind a certain amount of monies to pay towards the development of um, the EDRS system. The chief registrar of DITA herself is also in the meeting, so she wants to elaborate maybe later on um, with regard to um, 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 financial implications that it may have. But I can just mention that um, the branch is paying, a branch DITA registration um, is paying um, itself towards the, uh, the development of this system. But this uh, was, of course, done um, and discussed with the um, um, promulgation of the Electronic Deeds Registration Systems Act. And it was also um, dealt with in the socioeconomic um, impact assessment study that was done with regard to that bill. So the only um, matter that's now being, um, 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 uh, that relates to the EDRS Act and this current Deeds Registries Amendment Bill is just to amend the provisions of that bill to also uh, um, allow for electronic recordal of land tenure rights. Then um, 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 there was um, also, and uh, by many uh, um, honourable members, um, um, uh, questions with regard to the recordal of land tenure rights and um, that there is no enabling legislation in place. Um, and that is correct. There's no enabling legislation in place and they, uh, such legislation is needed to address um, the creation of these rights, the identification of these rights. Then um, this enabling legislation need to address um, dispute resolution mechanisms these are all um, um, things that cannot be uh, addressed by the Registrar of Deeds. Registrar of Deeds attend to the registration and the recordal, but all those um, uh, identification, the issuing, issuing of that rights, as the chairperson also said, um, we now amending section three to provide for the recordal of a land tenure rights that has been lawfully issued by government or um, a, a competent authority. And during public uh, consultations also, the question was asked, but who is the competent authority? And that was a question that um, uh, we could not answer because all those um, 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 matters will have to be um, addressed in an enabling legislation. I might just mention now, if you look at the short title of the bill, um, I just want to page there myself. The short title of the bill um, deals with the coming into operation of um, uh, the provisions of the Act, and it, it provides specifically for these um, um, sections, sections 3A, that um, extend the duties of the uh, Register of Deeds to attend to the recordal of the rights, um, as, um, all those sections that deal with the recordal, the making of regulations by the board, or the, uh, yeah, the making of the regulations by the minister with regard to the forms that uh, um, uh, must be followed with regard to the recordals. All those provisions we are providing in the short title of the bill, uh, which is clause 14, for those clauses to come into operation at a later stage. Um, those will come into operation on a date to be determined by the president by proclamation in the Gazette. However, the remaining sections will come into operation on a date um, um, of publication in, in, in the Gazette. Um, so um, I will talk about that um, at a later stage when I um, deal with the other the questions. Um, Honorable Masipa talked about um, the Law Society um, of South Africa that had um, a question with regard to the removal of the power um, from um, the board and to vest that power in the minister. Now, if you look at um, uh, the provisions of section nine, yes, it currently provides for that the board shall make, um, uh, um, has the power to make regulations. However, um, if you look at other legislation, for instance, if you look at the sectional titles act, um, if, uh, if you look at uh, the sectional titles act, act 95 of 1986, if you look at the Electronic Deeds Registration Systems Act, at um, Section 5, if you look at uh, Section 24C of the Upgrading of Land Tenure Rights Act, in all of those uh, legislation, 
um, um, uh, the, the, the power is given to the minister to make the regulations. However, the boards, um, like in the sectional titles act, you have the sectional titles regulation board. That board makes a recommendation to the minister. Uh, the board is uh, um, 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 represented by uh, the Banking Association of South Africa. It's represented by the relevant council of architects, the council of land surveyors, um, etc. And they all are experts in, in their fields. And they come up uh, with proposals um, and they make recommendations to the minister for amendment um, to the act. The same as with um, um, an, uh, the upgrading of land tenure rights. There is um, uh, um, also the minister makes uh, the regulations. And uh, with the Deeds Registries Act, um, um, we want to basically align those provisions with the provisions of the other legislation, as I mentioned. Also, if you look at um, the legislation that is being administered by the Department of um, uh, um, um, Human Settlements, the Sectional Title Schemes Management Act, the Community Service Ombud um, Act, there is a board in, 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 uh, um, established in uh, Section 24 of Act 8 of 2011, that is your Sectional Title Schemes Management Act, uh, uh, and that board also makes specific make recommendations to the minister of Department of Human Settlements. And it's then actually the minister that is making the regulations. So we, we basically just want to align. We're not taking any powers. We're just basically making it clear or we want to align it with the provisions of the other legislation that the board um, uh, and, and the boards are represented by, expert, uh, by people with expert knowledge. And then they make recommendations to the minister. And it is actually then the minister that provides and the government notice that is to be published. The minister then makes uh, uh, the regulations. Um, um, Honorable Masipa also uh, talked about um, a section three that um, provides for um, the recordal now of um, land tenure rights by a, a registrar of deeds without the enabling legislation uh, being in place. It was also the thinking um, of the department, um, if we bring this, um, if we extend um, uh, the duties of a register of deeds to attend to the recordal of these rights, but we repl uh, we place that enactment of that provision on ice, um, and to, to to bring it um, um, uh, to enact that provision once the enabling legislation um, is in place, we all know how long it is to take a bill through Parliament. Um, if we wait for the enabling legislation to be um, promulgated and then again amend the Deeds Registries Act, that may be um, a take, a, you know, it may um, take another couple of years then to again come back uh, to Parliament with an amendment to the Deeds Registries Act then to amend Section 3. So it was also the thinking of the Department to be proactive. Let's bring it into the Deeds Registries Act, but we put those provisions on ice, the, the enactment of those provisions on ice until the enabling legislation um, has been promulgated. Um, then um, um, there was a question by um, Honourable Member Kappa with regard to a legislation of the TBV um, countries. Um, I, I don't know if I understand uh, or understood the question. I can just mention um, also that um, there are um, a proclamations, et cetera, that provide for the issuing of of PTOs, uh, your permissions to, uh, to, to occupy, quitrants, et cetera. Those are, are, are land tenure rights that are um, issued by uh, traditional leaders or uh, councils. Um, uh, and um, for instance, a traditional leaders may uh, on local level um, uh, um, issue um, uh, uh, certain land tenure rights, quitrants, et cetera. Now, the first phase that the deeds office is currently busy with now with the um, development of the electronic deeds registration system is to provide for those um, uh, quitrants and, and, and PTOs to be captured into the EDRS system. So those recordals are not um, uh, taking place by the registrar of deeds, as we now envisage with the amendment of section three. Those are um, um, uh, um, um, uh, uh, tenure rights that are issued under other um, legislation, under other uh, um, um, uh, proclamations. However, now in the first phase of the electronic system, we are going to provide for the capturing um, of those already um, issued um, um, uh, rights, the quitrants. We're going to uh, provide for the, um, um, the electronic capturing of those rights 
into the EDRS system. That will also then um, um, uh, to get now to the next member, uh, um, member Mbata, that's it. Have we explored ways to protect the rights of those thousands of, of, of members out there? There are uh, uh, many uh, people out there that's got unprotected rights, um, um, uh, member Mba, um, um, Bamba uh, stated. And uh, what is um, the department doing to protect those rights? Have we explored means? So that is now where we are now with the first phase of the EDRS is basically to provide for the capturing of those rights into the EDRS, just so that we can also have a database um, with regard to, um, to, to um, uh, rights that has already been um, issued um, on a local level by the traditional um, um, leaders. Um, um, I just want to see what else. Um, um, Honourable Member uh, Mutretti um, was talking also about um, the regulation board. Um, what was the rationale about um, the amendment um, of amending section nine now to um, move that power from the board to the minister? Um, it's like I say, we just want to align that section nine. We want to align with section 54 of the sectional titles act that uh, um, section 54 provide for the minister to make uh, regulations upon recommendation by the board. So the minister cannot make regulations without the recommendation of the board. It must be recommendations by the board to the minister and then the minister making those regulations. The same process to be followed in terms of section five of act 19 of 2019, the electronic deeds registration systems act the board will make recommendations to the minister. And the same, of course, then uh, the sectional title schemes management act um, 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 that has been, um, is administered by the Department of Human Settlements, as well as the community schemes ombuds um, act, act eight and act nine of 2009. So it's basically just to align section nine of the deeds registries act with other legislation. Um, um, the chairperson also had questions um, with regard to um, the composition of the board. Um, let me just um, get to my bill. Um, as I stated, um, the Deeds Registries Act on a Business Trading Account, um, Section uh, or uh, Regulation 84 of um, uh, the Act contains a whole schedule of fees of office. And um, it provides um, different fees that must be paid for different types of registration. Your deed of transfer um, for property up to an amount of 1 million will attract this fee, um, a cancellation of a bond, et cetera. There is um, that schedule of fees. And um, once a year, um, the board sits and our at the office of the chief register of deeds, the uh, senior financial officer will give a presentation at the board the board is represented by members of the Legal Practice Council, et cetera, and they all look at um, 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 the increase if it is justified, et cetera. So um, due to um, 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 that operation of that, that fee account, as well as due to the development of this EDRS system, um, there was a need identified then for members with um, expert knowledge on um, financial issues and, and ICT issues to form part of a membership of the board. So um, section nine is now being amended to provide um, uh, for um, 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 uh, the senior financial officer and the office of the chief register of deeds. Also the senior financial officer of a national tr uh, treasury there will also be um, BASA, a member from the Banking Association of South Africa. They will be uh, members of the board. Then there will also be um, a member um, uh, from uh, um, a conveyancer from the Office of the uh, State um, Attorneys uh, will be a member. And then um, the um, Chief Director of ICT will also be a member. So it is basically, um, it, it, it is an increase of membership. But then, of course, the um, uh, Section 9 also provides for um, departmental officials will not uh, receive a, a remuneration 
with regard to attendance of the board. It's only members like your law society members and your bars are members um, that are um, 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 receive remuneration with regard to the hours of preparation. And of course, um, uh, and the fee that is payable to those um, 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 members are also um, 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 done in consultation with our minister and the minister of, of national uh, treasury. So there is the increase um, as, as, as with regard to the um, yeah, the Baza member and um, then um, the member um, of um, the um, official of the state attorney's office. Um, let me just see um, the tagging. Um, um, the office of the um, chief state law advisors can maybe talk about the tagging um, with regard to the bill. As like I say, um, those, those sections that deal with the recordal of land tenure rights, those provisions are put on ice until the enabling legislation is in place. So I think it is, uh, it is my opinion that when the enabling legislation, if for instance, your communal land rights bill is to talk about these issues, then the sayers uh, of the communal land tenure right bill will have to um, talk to, to, to the recordal issues. For instance, um, who is going to be your competent authority to, to issue these rights? Uh, the creation, which rights? Um, is it going to be over state land? Is it only going to be over private land? Um, you, you know, um, uh, can anybody uh, apply for a land tenure right to be recorded in the deeds office? Those questions that will uh, uh, were asked, that will be have to address in the enabling legislation, because the, um, the branch deeds registration does not have answers to those questions. That will have to be um, addressed in tenure legislation. That will probably be drafted by our tenure branch. And um, I don't know if it is going to be addressed in the land, a communal land tenure bill. Uh, Deeds did ask the question, and uh, it, it did not appear to be the um, communal land tenure uh, right bill when we did raise that question. But I think the tagging of the communal land tenure right bill, once it uh, contains these matters, that will then um, 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 result in a, um, um, a, a section 76 bill. But due to this bill being technical basically and only providing for recordal and registration issues, we did not, uh, and I think that's why the Office of the Chief State Law Advisors did not tag it a, a, a 76 bill. Um, I just want to um, address the amendment um, um, also, the chairperson asked, can anybody apply for the recordal of a tenure right? Now, uh, that's also a question I can't answer at this stage. I know with the upgrading of Land Tenure Rights in terms of the Ultra Act, your upgrading of Land Tenure Rights Act provides for um, opening of townships. And on the date of opening of townships, certain of those rights are automatically converted into, um, uh, into full title. Although that is now also being amended to provide for an application first to be made to the minister for um, um, upgrading into um, um, ownership. But section 2.2 of the Ultra Act provides for a register of deeds to record and to, to endorse title deeds with regard of the upgrading of that right into full ownership. So we've had an inquiry just um, two weeks ago of a person that also wants to know from the office of the chief register of deeds, can he bring his title? Um, I think he's got a, um, 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 a leasehold that needs to be endorsed in terms of section 2.2 of the um, Ultra Act um, uh, to, 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 to to, to reflect on his title deed that it has been upgraded. And we did invite that person and said, yes, section two of ULTRA does provide for a person basically just to walk into an act, uh, uh, into a deeds office and the register of deeds will then endorse. And in that specific um, case, it's endorsed in terms of section two, two of the ULTRA Act, uh, to, a register of deeds will then endorse that title deed to reflect that that title deed, that leasehold is now being upgraded into full ownership. So the same, if our enabling legislation provides for that, then a person will be um, able to walk with his, his land tenure right into the deeds office and a register of deeds will then, without the need of charging for office fees, endorse that deed um, a title um, or that leasehold um, to reflect um, that it's now um, uh, um, converted into full ownership. Um, 
um, rightfully, the chairperson mentioned there is no legislation that deals with um, a, a dispute a resolution, mechanism resolutions, um, um, and, um, um, uh, and also uh, the chairperson raised other questions with regard to other sections that is not um, being um, addressed in the presentation. If you look at the bill um, right after the schedule, there is a memorandum on the optics of the bill. And the uh, chairperson asked the, um, the question why uh, the amendment to section 62 of the act. Now, um, I just want to page, sorry, um, my apologies to um, clause nine of the bill uh, deals with the amendment of section 62 of the act. Now, section two of the act deals with the registration of notarial deeds, uh, notarial bonds. And currently the act provides for a notarial bond must be registered in the uh, um, area of uh, the jurisdiction of the deeds office in respect of which uh, the person that wants to register a bond in, in, in the area of which he um, uh, um, uh, resides, his residential addresses, as well as in the area of which the data carries on business. So it may be that a person um, lives in, in, in Cape Town, but he carries out business throughout the country. And then section 62 currently provides that if in such an instance, um, the notarial bond must be registered, um, um, let's say in Cape Town deeds office then, within a period of 30 days from the date of attestation of that um, 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 notarial deed by the notary public. But then section 62 now also provides that the, that same bond must be registered in all the other deeds registries and the areas are in, in which this data is carrying out business. So if it's carrying out business in all the other deeds office, it, um, section 62 provides then for registration of the deeds office then in, in a further period of 30 days and the second deeds registries act. And then in a further period of 30 days in the next deeds office. So it's very ambiguous to, to interpret the wording of section 62. So it's basically, um, if I now just want to go and look at the, it, it's just to clarify uh, the position with regard to that further uh, 30 days. It is now being amended to say that um, the notarial bond shall be registered within um, the first um, deeds registry within a period prescribed by section one, which is now um, your 30 days from date of attestation. And then it will be amended to say in the second deeds registry with an additional period of four months from the date of its registration and the first deeds registry, uh, registry, and then each successive registry with an additional period of four months within such extended period or as the court may on application uh, prescribed. So it is just basically, the, um, the procedure stays the same. It's just to clarify the, the period of time um, in the, of registration of the bond in the next uh, deed office. So that was the rationale behind uh, the whole amendment of section 62. If I can just go uh, to the chairperson's query with regard to um, the amendment of section 10 of the act, now, as I said, section 10 of the Act contains the whole list of subjects in respect of which uh, the board currently may make regulations, um, or uh, if it is going to be amended in terms of which the board then may make recommendations to the Minister for amendment. Also to be proactive, the department deemed it necessary at this stage to also um, uh, provide then for the board uh, to make um, a recommendation to the Minister um, uh, for the manner in which uh, um, uh, certain forms um, uh, and applications and consents uh, uh, um, uh, must be drafted. Uh, for instance, if a person wants to now apply for the recordal of your land tenure right, um, or, or uh, want to apply for um, a certificate of land uh, tenure right to be issued, or for the cancellation of your land tenure right. So those forms will have to be prescribed um, um, uh, uh, by regulation in the Deeds Registries Act. So also to be proactive, we brought that amendment into section 10. But of course, as I stated, clause 14 of the bill provide for all these clauses that deals with recordal to be put on ice until such time your enabling legislation is promulgated. And then of course, the department will um, uh, request the president to issue notification for, um, for those um, uh, clauses, those sections that deal with recordal 
to come into operation. Um, I don't know if I have um, um, addressed all questions, if, 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 if members can just maybe point out, but um, I don't know if the Chief Register of Deeds or any other official um, in the department um, want to, um, um, to, to make further uh, a presentation or answer further question, uh, questions to just clarify the matter on the recordal of land tenure rights. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Mamo Reynolds, for your responses. Any other responses from uh, the department? Uh, Chairperson, this is uh, Carly Skris and uh, the Chief Registrar speaking. I'm trying to switch on my camera, but uh, it does indicate to me that it, this device is unable to access my camera. My apologies for that. Um, I think uh, Ms. Reynolds have responded to the questions excellently, in my opinion. Um, maybe I, I must just again uh, uh, speak, and I, I hope I'm not repeating that what, what she has said. But the deeds registration system have in the past been criticized quite a lot uh, that it doesn't cater for the... Uh, um, rights of all citizens in our country and that there's a need uh, to transform the deeds registration system. And, and the recordal process um, is an attempt uh, towards that transformation that is um, required um, and hopefully there will be a, a day in time in the future where the system will actually be able to have all rights uh, reflecting in it and, and can be accessed for information and also provide proper information uh, for government purposes when that is required, for example, in land audits, etc. I know that there are initiatives now in our department uh, where they want to um, pilot um, recordals um, in certain provinces to test uh, also, the, the 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 how it will be recorded, etc., and and from the pilots, there will then of course be decisions made that will inform the enabling legislation that will be um, drafted by the land um, tenure um, component of our department, um, and and that is that is what was attempted. The rest of it, um, I don't have anything additional to what Ms. Reynolds have said. I just want to say the government officials on our board normally do include also um, persons from uh, NGMS, uh, the Surveyor General's Office, etc., cetera, um, or from legal, but it is officials that uh, is approved by the minister also um, to serve on our um, board when we sit. Thank you for the opportunity, Chairperson and, and, and members of Portfolio Committee. Thank you, Honorable Members. Those are the responses from the Deeds Registry. Um, any further follow-up questions? If not, uh, let me take this opportunity, honorable members, to uh, thank you all for availing yourselves for uh, today's uh, meeting as uh, we were dealing with the plant health Financiatory bill, as well as that of uh, the deeds registry uh, bill amendment bill. Uh, I would like to point it out, honourable members, that uh, both these bills are with the committee, and uh, having been uh, brought before the committee. Uh, 
now and the according to the rules after the first briefing which we have had today the next step for the portfolio committee according to national assembly rules is for us to uh, call for public participation uh, i'm informed by the secretariat that they have worked on uh, the adverts for the two uh, bills which they would uh, look uh, to uh, wanting to proceed in tabling the adverts uh, for the two bills we are still uh, waiting on the animal protection bill to see if we will be uh, proceeding once we engage on the issue of desirability on that, but it is also another bill we may be able to put out an advert on and uh, 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 proceed. But I must say, honorable members, that uh, we would like to request from the department to send to the Portfolio Committee on Agricultural and Reform and Rural Development a budget breakdown on how they are planning to cover the shortfall to implement the bill, including the report of the study, which Mr. Serrache has mentioned. With that said, honorable members, we look forward to uh, trying to process as much of the legislation as we have before us so that we can uh, get it through before the close of our term. Uh, we will uh, navigate accordingly and see how best we get to uh, concluding on these bills. That was all honorable members on our agenda. I want to again remind honorable members that on uh, Wednesday, we were requested to send nominations for the ARC, which uh, you can do through the Secretariat no later than four o'clock today. Those that uh, will have uh, names to submit, we can be able to then have them sent accordingly on behalf of the honorable members. Honorable members, that concludes the business of the day. And I would like to thank you all for having participated in this meeting and wish you a happy Friday. Do enjoy a great weekend ahead and uh, get some time to relax and spend with your loved ones. I want to thank the officials of the department for having been able to participate and be with us today. And also thank the deeds registry for availing themselves and for participating in today's uh, presentation and responses that they've been able to afford us. That concludes the business of the day and the meeting stands adjourned, honorable members.